Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight on a Thanksgiving week to come and talk about the origin of life. What could be more exciting? Um, tonight, my, my co-author on this is uh, Professor Change Tan. She's a professor of um, biological sciences at the University of Missouri. And I call her co-author because we're writing a book on this topic right now, and we hope to have it out by the summer. So the origin of life, um, where did we come from? How did life come to be? is certainly a topic that's been debated for many years. Uh, but you may not know it's actually been debated for thousands of years. Actually, a little bit of a history lesson here. That way back in the time of Aristotle, 300 BC, he wrote a book called The History of Animals. And in there he said, with animals, some spring from parent animals according to their kind. That much sounds like the Bible. But then he goes on, whilst others grow spontaneously and not from kindred stock, and of these instances of spontaneous generation, some come from putrefying earth or from vegetable matter, as in the case, as is the case with a number of insects. So he's proclaiming a belief that sometimes animals just, just pop up out of decaying matter, spontaneous generation. And back then, this was a common belief. And even for larger animals, there's accounts of people thinking that lions just popped up out of decaying stuff or mist from the earth. And of course, things like rats and rodents and insects was quite popular. Um, this belief in spontaneous generation went on for thousands of years. And over time, it, it slowly regressed to smaller and smaller forms of life. And so 2,000 years after this, people still believe that insects you know, like specifically maggots would just start to grow out of decaying flesh. So we have 2,000 years later in, 15, in 1668, Francesco Reddy, who is a, a scientist and a poet and a guy with some fantastic hair, <laughs> he wrote, he did some experiments on the generation of insects, like maggots growing out of decaying flesh, and had a really nice experiment to prove. And he said, I shall express my belief that the earth after having brought forth the first plants and animals at the beginning by order of the supreme and omnipotent creator, has never since produced any kinds of plants or animals, either perfect or imperfect. And everything which we know in past or present times that she has produced came solely from the true seeds of the plants and animals themselves. He's saying life only comes from life, it doesn't just pop up. So the belief in spontaneous generation shrank a little further after this. Um, at this time, people didn't really know about microscopic life, but he kind of proved that insects are not just going to pop up. But as people learned about microscopic life, they're like, well, maybe microscopic life could still pop up. And so 140 years later, we're now into the 19th century, and we have this man who's telling us not to be ignorant or superstitious. And he says, from the misconception of the ignorant or superstitious, it has been thought somewhat profane to speak in favor of spontaneous vital production. That sentence has a lot of double negatives in it, but he's basically saying that you're ignorant or superstitious if you speak against spontaneous vital production. And he goes on, there is therefore no absurdity in believing that the most simple animals and vegetables, specifically microscopic things, may be produced by the Congress of the parts of decomposing organic matter without what can be properly termed generation. So still a belief that spontaneous generation can occur at least on a microscopic scale. You see it kind of shrinking over time. Anybody know who this is? No guesses? This would be one Erasmus Darwin who is the grandfather of Charles Darwin. And he had a lot of influence on Charles Darwin. Charles loved his grandfather and respected him as a scientist. And he was a believer in spontaneous generation. So we go forward about another 50 years and the French Academy of Sciences put up a kind of a contest or a call for proposals to, to see if they could put an end to this or a, a scientific conclusion about can things generate spontaneously. And we have Louis Pasteur, who was really famous, of course, for dealing with microscopic life. And he conducted a very famous experiment with 
with like a soup broth in a flask and would boil it to sterilize it. And it had this fancy swan necked um, bottle to it. So after boiling it and making it sterile, you could wait forever and you'd never get growth of bacteria microscopic life. But if you broke the neck off of it and let it open up to air, then you would get microbial growth. So this was a mortal blow to this belief that microscopic life could just spontaneously generate. And he said, never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow of this simple experiment. There is no known circumstance in which it can be confirmed that microscopic beings came into the world without germs, without parents similar to themselves. So that's a pretty awesome scientific result. But I don't think it was quite the mortal blow that he intended because belief regressed even further. We're already to microscopic life, but belief continued that maybe once long ago in history, it happened. Maybe once, that's how life got started, a spontaneous generation of life from non-life. And of course, we have Charles Darwin. Um, this is a letter he wrote to a friend, a rather famous quote. Um, it's a quote about the um, warm little pond, a warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. So his belief that that warm little pond is where life began long, long ago, and then of course evolved to what we see today. Um, so spontaneous generation starting big, shrinking down and down and down, and then kind of going back in history. And there are remnants of it today, and we can't seem to get rid of it. So Darwin believed or hoped that life could have started spontaneously from purely natural processes. Um, Pasteur would say that's impossible, but Darwin can say, hey, you can't prove that it did not happen. It is a theory or a hypothesis that is not falsifiable. You can't possibly say that it didn't happen. And in the book I wrote a couple of years ago, there's a chapter on this um, in that one chapter basically saying, it's true, you can't prove that it didn't happen. And what you believe about the origin of life is, is ultimately a matter of faith, whether you believe one way or the other. But, but today we're gonna to go through a lot of evidence, and I'm not trying to say I can prove it, but there's a whole lot of evidence to make it seem quite difficult. Keep in mind that by definition, anyone who says they're an atheist must believe that this happened, right? Because there is no supreme supernatural anything, so it must have happened through natural causes. Although science can say when no one has ever observed life arising from non-living materials. That's where we stand. Except maybe there's one modern exception that I need to show you and we need to talk through if I can get this all to work. Uh, we're here today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell, a cell made by uh, starting with the digital code and the computer, uh, building the chromosome uh, from four bottles of chemicals, uh, assembling that chromosome in yeast, transplanting it uh, into a recipient bacterial cell and transforming that cell into a new bacterial species. So uh, this is the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. That's that. So the, the first replicates, the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Laboratories have been trying for decades to produce life from non-life in a flask. And here you have a kind of a strong claim to that end. But this sent ripples through society. You know, President Obama reacted to this by getting a bioethics commission together to say, what is the bioethics of this? Is it safe? This whole synthetic biology thing. David Diemer, who is a pretty well-known researcher in the origin of life, trying to prove that it happened naturally, he wrote an, an article, said the origin of life just got closer. He finds this to be very encouraging. Also, Arthur Kaplan wrote an article called The End of Vitalism. And we have Dr. Zanonos and Kim who wrote, uh, not only did Venter's audacious statements and claims of synthetic life mark a triumph of biotechnolo 
technological ingenuity, but they also undermined the foundations of religions and cosmotherapy, cosmotheories, cultures, ethics, and law, questioning the essence of life itself. So there's a lot of, a lot of ripples, a lot of press from this. But uh, as we just heard from the question, we need a little reality check to this. What Venter, Venter did accomplish that was pretty cool was he synthesized a genome, a DNA that was over a million base pairs long, and that's never really been done before. That's quite impressive. But you know, the building blocks that he started with, you heard him say four bottles of chemicals. These are nucleotides that make up the DNA. And those building blocks are pure materials, not the kind of stuff you would have found on the early Earth. And those kind of pure materials, we'll talk about it later, but they can only be produced with the help of living organisms. It's not something that you can just find without life around. Um, except for the useless watermarks that they put into the genome, the DNA was basically copied from existing life. We have over a million base pairs in the genome of this synthetic life, but you see 98.55% came from a type of bacteria. Uh, another 1% came from yeast, a little piece from bacteria, another bacteria. And then we have these watermarks, which is entirely useless DNA that they put in there, it's basically a translation of English characters into the DNA so that the authors, the scientists, could put their names into the DNA and be famous forever. <laughs> now, of course, that has no value to the creature. It's just junk for it. But that's the one piece of DNA that they designed from scratch. The rest of it is pieces borrowed from life. And when they when they tried to build this one mega, mega base pair genome, they had to use replication machinery, the proteins, the machinery that's only found in these living organisms in order to manufacture this. Because the, the human ways of, of getting DNA together are, are very error prone. You could never get to a million base pairs. You'd never get there. They can only synthesize maybe 100 base pairs in an oligo at one time. So they had to use the replication replication machinery. And finally, the completed genome, as you said back there, they took the completed genome because the DNA by itself doesn't do anything. They had to inject it into a bacteria that was very similar to this one and, um, and use the machinery already in the cell, the cell membrane, the proteins, the RNA, all that machinery is there. It's basically like taking a computer, taking out Windows 7 and putting in Windows 10. The Windows 10 on its own doesn't do anything unless you have all the machinery to make it run. That's what they did. So we have some lessons learned from what he accomplished. Um, the first is that living organisms were required to produce the building blocks. Living organisms provided the actual DNA sequences. Living organisms were required to assemble the DNA. Living organisms were required to use the DNA in order to make, make life. Um, we also learned, I didn't mention this, but um, they, they finished creating this uh, one mega, mega base DNA and they put it into the cell and it died. And after all that work, that's very disappointing. We're talking about 14 years of work to build up to this point. And it just died. And it took them another year to figure out what was wrong. There was one mistake, one typo out of a million base pairs and it just happened to be in an essential gene called DNAA, which is used to copy DNA. You need it to replicate your DNA, and it was broken from that one mistake. It's called an essential gene. So where do these essential genes come from if they're so sensitive and life is so dependent upon them? They are essential. So we also learned that Venter excels in showmanship. Um, a, a friend of his said, the only regulation we need is of my colleague's mouth. <laughs> so we still have some work to do here to understand how life could arise from non-life. Doing that, the arising first life has a special term called abiogenesis. And that's what we're going to try to understand. Um, we know that no one has ever observed it happening, not even Craig Venter. We know that atheists believe that it happened at least once. 
Now, atheists, in order to maintain their belief, to try to defend their belief, they're going to work hard to try to simplify life, make it seem really simple, provide some basic steps, and that's all. We're talking thousands of papers published every year, um, trying to encourage a belief in this, give a little bit of hope that it could happen. But I'd like to show you a little bit of their mindset in trying to simplify life. So this is back from the 1876 with Ernst Haeckel. And he said, during late years, we have become acquainted with Monera. Monera today would be called bacteria. That's kind of the old name they had. Organisms which are in fact not composed of any organs at all, but consist entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. The entire body of one of these Monera during life is nothing more than a shapeless, mobile, little lump of mucus or slime consisting of an albuminous combination of carbon. Simpler or more imperfect organisms we cannot possibly conceive. So anybody a microbiologist in here <laughs> who knows the complexity of even the simplest of bacteria? Um, this is an incredibly ignorant kind of statement, but we can excuse him because this is, you know, 140 years ago and they didn't know much about bacteria then, but his assumption was it's just a little piece of mucus or slime and there's nothing to it. Today we know better, but people are still making the same kind of mistake, same kind of statement, because they really want life to be simple. This is a modern biology textbook. Maybe some of you or your students have had this textbook. And in there it says, life began when organic molecules assembled in a coordinated manner within a cell membrane and began reproducing. And that's like, end of story, right? It was that simple. And it's said with such confidence, it doesn't say we think or possibly, maybe, it says with absolute certainty that that is what happened and this is what our kids are learning. Our old friend Bill Nye, the science guy, he says the origin of life just requires some raw material that could allow the spark of life to emerge. And it's in a book ironically called Undeniable. Even though nobody's ever seen this happen, no lab can produce any of it, it's an undeniable statement from a science guy. Dan Brown wrote a book where it says, life arose spontaneously from the laws of physics. Now we know that this is fiction, but we also know Dan Brown, and this is something he really wants, wants you to believe. Speaking of physics, here we have a, a professor of physics from MIT. He says, you start with a random clump of atoms, and if you shine light on it for long enough, it should not be so surprising that you get a plant. <laughs> professor of physics from MIT. They're all trying to make it seem simple, but it's never been seen before. So is life really so simple? And what would it take to get life started from a purely natural process? So what I want to walk you through now is what change and I think are the sequence of steps that you would have to get through in order for this to happen. And it's called a stairway because you've got to climb all these stairs. You have to get past each of these steps. And we're talking about a transition from chemistry, things that look like chemistry, up until you get to things that look like biology. So non-living chemical reactions up to things that are living. And we'll go through these steps in sequence. Each step is kind of building on the other one. Um, you know, we'll go through each one. And then in the next step, you kind of assume that the previous step has been fulfilled. Even though it hasn't, you have to assume that in order to get to the next step. So let's start here with the formation of the building blocks. You've probably all seen this figure. It's in every biology textbook, and it's from the Miller-Urey experiment. This is from 1950-ish, where you just take methane, ammonia, hydrogen, water, and you put it into a chamber with boiling water and some sparks. And over time, you get some organic molecules. You can get some amino acids from that. Uh, mostly you end up with a bunch of organic junk that isn't part of life, they called it tar. But you can dig around and find some amino acids in there. This is put in our biology textbooks in public schools to encourage people to believe that this is pretty close to life, right? It, it could happen. And it's close enough that a lot of people believe that. In fact, George Gaylord Simpson here published in 1960, 
in science. The consensus is that life did arise naturally from the non-living and that even the first living things were not specially created. The conclusion has indeed really become inescapable for the first steps in that process have already been repeated in several laboratories. So you can repeat this process and this guy is completely convinced that because of that, it's, it's a done deal. Well, a little reality check there. In this staircase, what Miller Urey accomplished is a little piece of the first step here. A few amino acids produced is, is not life, and it's not really even close to life, and we'll go through the rest of the steps, but that remains what they accomplished, and that's enough to convince some people and be in your textbook in biology and tell your kids about it. So the next step is about homochirality. Um, organic molecules, if you have carbon attached to four different groups, it's inherently going to have what's called chirality, which means there's a, a symmetry. You can have a left-handed or a right-handed version with mirror symmetry. They're not the same, but they sure look the same, just like your left hand and right hand. They're not superimposable. And if you produce this from any kind of a chemical reaction, like miller ure did, you're always going to get a 50-50 mixture called a racemic mixture. You're always going to get 50% of each of those, and that's what you're going to get. And there's no natural, outside of life, there's no known way to separate one versus the other because they have the same energy. Well, in life, things aren't quite that way. We always see DNA, the nice looking structure like this. Um, but it turns out that every nucleotide that's in each piece of DNA has three different chiral locations in every nucleotide. And every chiral location of every one of the nucleotides, six billion of them in every cell in your body has the same chirality. There's no mixture, there's no left and right. It's always the same in every life form everywhere on the planet that's ever been seen. That's just DNA. RNA, it turns out, has four locations that are chiral. And in every chiral location of every RNA molecule in life, they all have the same chirality. It's not a mixture, it's not a random thing. What about proteins? The amino acids that make up proteins through these peptide bonds, there's 20 amino acids, 19 of them have chirality, and it's always um, right-handed chirality in proteins in life. It's always right, every one of these right-handed. If only one amino acid is replaced by the optical or chiral counterpart, then the protein will no longer fulfill its task because of destabilization effects induced by the distorted structure of alpha helices and beta, sheet, beta sheets. So basically saying a protein can only be functional if it has homochirality, the same chirality at each location. Phospholipids, your membranes of all of your cells are made up of phospholipids. The phospholipid has a, a glycerol molecule in here, and the center of it is chiral location. Every eukaryote, which includes you, and every bacteria, every phospholipid happens to be left-handed all the time. Strangely, in the third domain of life, which is called archaea, they always have right-handed right phospholipids. Their glycerol molecule is always right-handed. And it's produced by entirely different enzymes than, than what makes our phospholipids. And yet, we're taught that the three domains of life have a common ancestor, that we came from a common ancestor, even though there's some very large differences between us. So life is full of homochirality. The only known way to produce homochirality, including what Craig Venter used as his starting materials, it requires contributions from molecular machinery that's found only in, in life, in living organisms. And this molecular machinery that does the job happens also to be homochiral, right? So there's a big divider here between what's alive and what's not alive. If you're doing some excavation as a paleontologist and you find in the mud there, you find some amino acids, you can actually look at those. If they turn out to be homochiral, you can say that must have come from a life form. It's a way of testing, is this from a life form or is this from some natural source? 
So how could life have become exclusively homochiral through natural processes? Nobody knows the answer to that, and that's number two. And we move on to what's called the paradox of water. In life, water is essential for life, but it's also quite detrimental to life. If you take two amino acids and you want to combine them together to make a peptide bond for a protein, you have to extract the water, extracted water. But if you're, if you're in a place that's full of water, that reaction is not likely to happen. It's kind of like trying to wring out a wet rag underwater if you're trying to combine these things when you're in water. And to do it in life, it requires energy. You have to supply energy to make this reaction happen. It doesn't happen. It wants to go the other way. Also, water is very detrimental to DNA and RNA. There's a reaction called a deamination, which uh, destroys the nucleobases. It ch changes the code, basically, of the DNA. Also, depurination is complete removal of a nucleotide, of a nucleobase. This is happening in every cell in your body thousands of times per day. Water is degrading the code of your DNA. Thankfully, we've been given some DNA repair mechanisms that we'll talk about that are essential for life, and there's always repairing your DNA because of the destructive parts of water. So it wouldn't be possible to have a DNA molecule show up and sit around for thousands of years waiting for a cell to grow around it because it would be falling apart. Now we have consistent linkage of the building blocks is our next step. We always see DNA looks like this. It's a beautiful, consistently linked up molecule. Same with RNA, same with proteins. But it doesn't actually turn out that way if you just do it in a lab. Here we have two nucleotides that are connected the way they should be in all of life. Always connected in this way. These are other arrangements that are possible. If you throw this stuff into a, a beaker and cause reactions, you're going to get a mixture of all these different possibilities. And only one kind, we call it homo linkage, is what's found in life. And this is only two nucleotides. If you start adding more and more and more, the probabilities multiply, becomes less and less and less and less likely that you could get the right arrangement. Yet only one arrangement exists in all of life. The same is true for proteins. If you take two amino acids and bond them together, this um, alpha peptide bond is the only way <coughs> they come together in all of life. So you could have lysine first or lysine second. These are both found in life. These are also, these are all these arrangements are possible ways to bond them together that are wrong. You don't find those in life. It doesn't exist that way. So doing it naturally, you're going to get a mixture of all this junk that you don't want. Especially as it gets longer and longer, it becomes almost impossible to get the same linkage that you want. Now we move on to biopolymer reproduction. We know that reproduction is an essential part of life. Um, but reproducing cells is something that's extremely complex. So people who believe in spontaneous generation of life, again, they have to have a simpler explanation. They have to have a way of making it seem simple. So rather than starting with reproduction of a cell, which is crazy complicated, they start with reproduction of a molecule, a molecule that's able to reproduce itself. And as it reproduces itself, maybe some errors have come in. And those errors maybe make it better than the one before it. It can reproduce itself faster. And so it dominates. And then another mistake happens, and that's even better. And it dominates over the other guys. So sort of like evolution, you have generations that get better and better over time. And that's how they say that we build up complexity aiming toward getting at life. It's a nice story, um, but it's never been seen happening. So in, in life, DNA, we know DNA can be replicated, but it actually takes 14 <laughs> different enzymes. We're talking about 25 proteins coming together to do the task of reproducing DNA. So reproduction of DNA doesn't happen on its own. It's extremely complicated. So they've given up on that. But they do like the idea of RNA, RNA able to reproduce itself. It's called the RNA world hypothesis. 
that life began with RNA that's able to store information and be a catalytic agent like an enzyme. Um, this would require RNA to be capable of this molecular evolution, capable of reproducing itself and having mistakes come and make it better and better. If that were true, then self-replicating RNA should be pervasive. It should be everywhere. You should be walking into a lab and saying, oh, darn, it's another self-replicating RNA. <laughs> They're always doing that. Because you need thousands and thousands of generations of it, slight modifications, all doing the same thing. The problem with that theory is that it's never been found. The closest we've come, and this is just this year, is this is RNA, this is RNA. Um, together they form a dimer, and it contains 288 different nucleotides. The closest we've come is this. It's not capable of copying itself, but if you give it another piece of RNA as a template, it can reproduce that template. But unfortunately, it produces the antisense RNA. You know, you, if you get a C, it'll match it with a G. If you get a U, it'll match it with an A. So you get the opposite. And when you get those opposites, they glue together and you can't get them separated. So it kind of ruins your template. And that's the most that they've been able to accomplish, even with something as complicated as that. But they keep trying. So biopolymer reproduction is kind of a dead end, but it's essential to try to get to life. Now we have to, assuming all that can be done, now we have to get to where we have a useful code or a gene. Um, so DNA or RNA has the power of, of representing any code. You could actually take the English language and convert it to DNA. It's a kind of universal coding system, which is what is needed for life. Uh, the problem is, um, how do you get a specific code? How do you get something that's useful out of it? So, um, these, this molecule, this pair of molecules that I showed you so far, is, is, is the best RNA that's been found so far. So imagine how you're going to get to that as a starting point, if this thing could reproduce itself. How do you get to that as a starting point? Well, it's 288 nucleotides which means you have four to the power of 288 possible codes to generate this. And it turns out that if the entire mass of the universe was RNA of the size of 288 nucleotides, you still probably wouldn't get this specific code anywhere in the entire universe if it was all made out of RNA. That's how rare it would be to get something this complicated from a random process. And you can't evolve to get to this because it hasn't yet started reproducing itself. This is just the beginning of what they hope could be a molecular evolution. And then to put this in frame, in, in the right context, the smallest known living geno organism has a genome of 577,000 nucleotides. Right? This is only 288, just to put it in context. So, if you could get over all of that, <laughs> now you gotta, you're getting tired of me going through this. <laughs> now we have to go through gene regulation. Genes, um, in life, genes are often living in opposition to each other. We have, we have proteins that break bonds in DNA. We have proteins that create bonds in DNA. These are opposing. You have kinase, which attaches phosphate to a protein, and you have phosphatases that take phosphate away from a protein. They're living in opposition. So you can't just have genes willy-nilly doing what they do because they tend to oppose each other. You need orchestration. You need your genes to be doing like an orchestra, everybody working and doing their part at the right time. That's the only way you can get life going. Another analogy would be uh, an eight-cylinder engine with spark plugs that randomly spark, right? And you want the engine to get started, but they're opposing each other. You're not going to get anywhere. In, in real life, even in the simplest prokaryotes, you have all kinds of regulation going on during transcription, translation, post-translational. There's all these different ways to control and regulate what genes are up to. Otherwise, you just have chaos. Now we get to, next step is how to repair biopolymers. So we already talked about how DNA is degraded by water. Water makes it fall apart, basically.
So you have to repair these damaged nucleotides. In life, there's a lot of ways to repair DNA, but the simplest form that's well conserved over all, of, all kinds of life is called this base excision repair pathway. And it involves five different enzymes. Enzymes are complex proteins that are used to repair the DNA. So where are you gonna get these five complex proteins from? Again, you can't get them from random acts. They have to come from DNA, which doesn't make sense. So if DNA repair is essential for life, but the mechanisms for DNA repair happen to be encoded in the DNA, how are you supposed to get this process started? You can't have one without the other. So if that's not convincing enough that we can't get life started, we also need to have a membrane around this thing. You can't just have life floating around in the ocean. It has to be contained. And here, the folks who believe in abiogenesis think they've got the upper hand. Because if you just take phospholipids and you put them in water, they naturally form into a bilayer, a lipid bilayer like this, and they naturally form into, into little bubbles, little cells. So you could say membranes form spontaneously from natural processes, and this is something they, they got this one, right? But, there's a big but here. No living organism has a membrane that looks anything like that for real because in life, an essential function of membranes is to maintain an electrical voltage across them, basically a, a gradient of protons. And so that means that the membrane has to be impermeable to protons. But any membrane that's that tight would basically just be a tomb um, containing everything, nothing gets in, nothing gets out. You have to have the membrane allow building blocks to get through and waste to get out. So these are kind of conflicting requirements on a membrane. Very tight, but also kind of loose. In life, that's accomplished by proteins that are embedded in the membrane. And in fact, about half of the weight of a membrane is actually proteins. It's not just these phospholipids that happen to form up naturally. And the proteins are highly specific in what they let in and in what direction they let something in and what direction they let something out. And they don't let the, prot the protons get through. So this simplest organism known to mankind, which is Mycoplasma genitalium, it has 142 different proteins that work in the cell membrane. The cell membrane is extremely complex, even in the simplest form of life. So just as every cell comes from a cell, maybe you never thought of this, but every membrane comes only from another membrane. Every cell inherits the membrane from their parents, and they can make the membrane grow, they can add to it, but no, one, no cell ever starts its own membrane. You always get it from, from dad, from mom and dad. Okay, so if you think we can get over all that, we still need a form of energy. You gotta have energy in life. And um, <clears throat> life requires energy. Across all of life, there's a process that life uses to harness energy and it's called chemiosmotic coupling. And that basically means um, taking electrons from a source of food and passing them off through a redox reaction to somebody else who wants the electrons and that's your source of energy. Um, we use food. McDonald's is a common source. Other living things use sunlight. You could even use sulfur. And you use that to convert, to create a voltage across the membrane, kind of like charging up a battery. But the voltage across the membrane is used to produce ATP from ADP. And that's the kind of the universal battery in life. You charge up this battery, make ATP, and now you can plug that battery into all kinds of machines to get all kinds of work done. That's what happens in life. But it's extremely complicated. This is a molecule called complex one that is highly conserved across all of life, although it gets more complex with higher forms of life. But this is the simplest type. It's found in a bacteria. It's got a lot of proteins that come together. People think of proteins working on their own 
but they tend to work actually together in parts. Here you have like 15 proteins snapped together to make this nano machine. This nano machine strips electrons off of food and it hands those electrons through a series of redox reactions, kind of like passing a hot potato around. Electrons are, are scary business. If you drop the electron, it could cause some big problems. So you gotta hand it off, but really quickly hand it off again. And that's what these guys are doing across the membrane. And the goal is to have few protons inside and many protons outside. So you create this electric voltage across the membrane. This is only complex one. There's actually complex three and four. Together, there's about 25 proteins, even in the simplest form of life. And that's just used to create a proton gradient. And that's what keeps us alive. If you suddenly lost your proton gradients, you wouldn't be able to get to the next slide. <laughs> You'd be out, that would be it. So we're grateful for our proton gradients. Now, once you have the proton gradients, this is where it gets pretty cool. You've got ATP synthase there, which you've got few protons inside and lots of protons outside, right? This is a voltage. This is an electric machine, a nano machine. It's comprised of a minimum of 20 proteins. That's in the simplest types of life. It gets higher in more complicated life. This rotates at about 7,800 RPM. Um, the protons come in here and they take a seat on the merry-go-round. This merry-go-round goes around one time and then the proton jumps off and enters the cell this way, see? So this is driving the reaction. As this spins around, the shaft here spins. This is stator, it stays in one place. And you can kind of picture this as a kind of umbrella over what's spinning here. And this is kind of like a camshaft that mechanically forces ADP plus phosphorus into ATP. This is charging up the batteries in your cell and this is running all day long, all the time. So together with this machine and the other stuff I showed you, we're talking about 45 complex proteins required to snap together to make this chemiosmotic coupling possible. And that's in the simplest forms of life. So that is energy harnessing 101 in life. So how are you gonna get that from a natural process? So we're almost done. You've, you've done well. We're getting close to where we have life. We haven't really mentioned yet the essential, essential interactions between DNA and RNA and proteins. Um, we kind of talk about these things in isolation, but we know that proteins in life are only produced from RNA, from DNA via RNA, right? Everything's dependent on everything. DNA cannot reproduce itself without proteins and without RNA, right? RNA can be produced by DNA. This is all interconnected and it's like irreducibly complex. You have to have all of it. You can't just live with one of them. Okay, we're ready to get to the pinnacle. The last step of all, assuming everything else has happened, we now have all of it encased in a membrane, all of this complexity and we have what you call a minimal cell. And we know from life, existing life, that the minimal cell, we've already talked about it, this mycoplasma genitalium, 516 genes and 577,000 base pairs. That's the simplest form of life that we've ever found. So the people who want to promote a belief in abiogenesis, in spontaneous life, they want this to be much simpler than that. They wanna find some way that life could be simpler than that, because that's very complex. So they use the term proto-cells, much simpler cells that evolved into something like we have today. But no one's ever found one of those proto-cells. We do have people working on it. So Craig Venter's back, and he recently published a paper where they've, they've chiseled this down down to 473 genes, 513,000 base pairs. They're trying to chisel it down to make a life that's really simple. But of course, when you start chipping things off of here and chiseling it down, you end up with an organism that becomes less robust. It's weaker, it can't handle temperature changes or any kind of stresses, right? 
the more you chisel it down, you end up with something that's extraordinarily weak and can only survive in very controlled setting. So I don't think that's going to produce much fruit for them. In fact, he said in the conclusion of this paper that the minimal cell concept appears simple at first glance, but becomes more complex upon close inspection. And I think we all knew that already, but they're going to keep trying. So thank you for going through that with me. It's a long, hard pathway. But now we're to the take home message. This is what you need to remember. Four words. Life is not simple. And there is no evidence that any of those 12 steps that we've gone through on the stairway to life could have happened naturally by purely natural means. But by definition, every atheist believes that all 12 of those steps, and I'm sure there are other steps that we haven't discovered yet or I haven't thought of. There's going to be more steps the more we learn. But atheists have to believe that that all happened naturally. Unfortunately, science can't prove that they're wrong. All we can do is, is look at the evidence and, and, and think about it, but it'll never be conclusively proof. The real irony here is that you'll see atheists arguing that science supports their belief and all other beliefs are faith-based. <laughs> yeah. And they'll, they'll throw that at you time and again. So I want to finish with one more quote. This quote is from Francis Crick, who, you know, together with Watson, uh, got the Nobel Prize for figuring out the structure of DNA. Francis Crick, in his later years, believed in abiogenesis. He had a hard time adopting it, but eventually adopted it. And here he said that an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many, so many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. And I'm telling you that here we have all these steps, and I think it's very clear that we are looking at a miracle. And we're looking at each of these steps as a testimony to our God, to his power, his authority, and to him be all the glory. And that's all I have to say. Any questions then? Yes, hi. So the folks that are trying to do this in a lab, you're asking them what, what could they create and could it be dangerous, right? It's not going to be a living organism as we understand it, but can it be... Something? Well, what, what Venter already did is a, is a kind of hybrid organism, right? And that's why, um, you know, President Obama had a, a bioethics commission to look into this because of concerns about something dangerous coming out of that. And, and those are real concerns. They do build in safety factors to these things, like they make them intentionally sensitive to antibiotics. So you just put an antibiotic in there and it'll kill the whole thing. I mean, but these safety features could be overwhelmed at some point or somebody's going to make a mistake. So there is a concern about it. What do you think is the worst case scenario? Well, you could create something that's, that's virulent, right, that could get out and, and cause a disease. I, don't, I think that's pretty unlikely, but it could happen. So there, there are people who are trying to build from the bottom up, you know, starting with molecules and see if they can get it to go upward. And there's people trying to go from the top down. And that last slide from Venter is he's trying to go from top down to make it simpler and simpler. So the people coming from the bottom up, I don't think is too concerning because they're probably not going to get very far. <laughs> Thank you.
So yeah, the question is, if you, if you form a membrane in water and you add some protein, does, does the protein find its way in to the membrane or, or form at the same time by, by luck, I guess? Um, it's possible that you could trap a few proteins in there as it forms, but once it forms, it's, it's such a tight bond, it's impermeable to protons, so you can't get a protein in there it's, it's too, too tight of a fit. So in life, there are actually proteins already in the membrane that are kind of chaperoning other proteins to come and join me, right? They form a channel and the protein can find its way in and then be kind of released into the membrane. Otherwise, it, it can't get in on its own. There's a chance, of course, as you said, that they would be trapped by kind of dumb luck, but I don't think it would be significant to go anywhere in in the membrane right you could trap a few perhaps yep right by yep what's <laughs> the the biopolymer reproduction is that reproduction of the cell the cell the you talked about how it has to the cell has to divide and multiply and reproduce itself is that the step you're talking about there, or is that something that's not included in your steroid? Well, cell reproduction, first you have to have a cell for the cell to reproduce. So that's at the very, very top of the steroid. This, this poly biopolymer reproduction is considered by those who believe in the concept to be an early step of how you would get molecular evolution started. So they don't think they have to create uh, reproducible Life doesn't have to, by definition, reproduce itself to be considered life. No, I think it does. Yeah. But, but you it's need to there. get there. You can't get there by starting with a cell. You have to get there by starting with something simple. Right. And they're saying that has to reproduce itself and then evolve toward a cell. So they're not saying a, a self-reproducing RNA would be life, but it's a, a good step to get toward life. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Um, yeah, you asked if the membrane that the ATP synthase works in yeah. is encoded by DNA or just or just inherited. Yeah. And the answer is both. It's, it's inherited because every daughter cell gets it from their parents, but then they build onto it. So they have the ability to add to it and basically following the template of the membrane they've been given, inherited, they can make more of it. But I don't think they have the ability to like start from scratch and, and build a membrane. So in, in eukaryotes, that energy process happens in your mitochondria. That's the mitochondria is the energy plant of, of all of you. But in prokaryotes, they don't have a mitochondria, so they do it on their on their cell membrane. But it's a similar process. Yeah. Yes. Rob, in your first book, you have any examples? Yeah. Are we going to build probabilities? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I've seen many books that go into arguments of probability. And um, I don't know what you think, but I, I don't find it so convincing because you just have so many zeros. And the opposition will say, yeah, but it, it could happen. <laughs> And that, so what, what difference does it make if there's 100 zeros or 200 zeros? And there's a lot of assumptions you have to put into that kind of math. And so I think it, to me, it's not so effective. I did give you one number in this talk, but I try to avoid. It's a big, it's a big number, yeah. OK, over here, Brent. Um, from an overview, both theologically and scientifically, it does say in the beginning of Genesis that the Lord formed Animals out of the ground, and assuming that the ground that he formed it was inanimate stuff. Also, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, evolutionists who say that uh, uh, there are building blocks here, they don't go quite far enough. Who made the building blocks that uh, 
natural processes right. work for it. Uh, they don't go that far. And usually the answer is we don't know and we don't want to find out. <laughs> Well, if you're talking about building blocks like amino acids, they think they have the answer to that, or, or some nucleotides, but they, they can't get to a homochiral, homolinked building blocks to make anything useful. That, that is way far out for them. It's, it's astounding the, the stamina and the persistence that these folks have. I mean, there are some people who literally have given their life as brilliant scientists to try to make progress here. Um, and, and, they're, and they're getting a lot of research money and doing their research and thousands of papers, but there's not too much progress, I would say. So my understanding with Francis Crick is that he, he, yeah, he wanted, he wanted life to have a natural source, but it was very hard to believe this could have happened, especially here on Earth. If the probability is really low, you could increase your probabilities if you include the whole universe, right? And in fact, if there's multiverse out there and you have multiple universes, then the probabilities <laughs> really get better. So that leads to this panspermia, thinking that life began somewhere else. And he, he, was a bit, he was a fan of that, for sure. But you know whether it happened here or some other planet, it still has to get through those, um, those steps. Yeah. Uh, instead of creating life, wouldn't it be uh, potentially easier to restore life? I mean, we have a lot of roadkill out there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're asking, wouldn't it be easier to bring something dead back to life than to bring life out of it? <laughs> it's a good comment. I'm with you. I, on this top step, I was going to use an example that if you, took, if you took billions of bacteria and cracked them open like an egg, just spilled out their contents and threw it all in a dish and just sat there and waited for something to happen, right? We know that life wouldn't come out of that um, because... <laughs> It needs to be intact, and it's kind of like having a dead squirrel. You've got all the materials there. You got proteins. You got DNA. You got, but, it, but it's not. It's not alive. Yeah. Why couldn't science uh, set up some kind of a metric that would prove that this is totally impossible to happen by natural causes as we understand them? Simply cannot. Uh, there must be some. You don't have to. You don't. Take probabilities will do the trick. What about uh, the uh, measures of well, let's measure complexity uh, in, in, in information? It, it's impossible to create this much information that's this interactive, that's this irreducibly complex, and expect it to happen by some chain of events. It just can't happen, and he should be able to prove that some way. I agree with you, but I don't think you can. Prove it. You, you can simply state your you can state your case. So unlikely. So unlikely. It abiogenesis, I believe, is a unfalsifiable claim. And that, if you talk to Karl Popper, the great philosopher, he says that means it's not even science. It's not subject to science, which I kind of believe too. I don't think science has any business trying to yeah, study this. It's. In the end, you're going to have to have an element of faith. Whether you believe this or that, it's faith. But, but this helps. Don't know, but they don't know. Yeah, they don't and know it, the science is limited. And I'm with you because I've given it my best shot. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are going to be convinced? I don't know, but I'm going to try it. Back in the back. These 12 criteria. Yeah. So this is a this is a preemptive kind of talk. I've never talked on this before, and I'm working on the book with my co-author, Change Chance. So we're hoping by summertime to have... 
Yeah. And you'll be able to get it here uh, when it comes out. Um, there are copies of, of my other book, which just has one chapter on this topic. But Yes? I was just thinking, any type of reproduction has to be from something that's already existing, right? Yes? Is that a yeah, you can't, you can't reproduce something unless it already exists. Yeah, right. So the first molecule that could hypothetically reproduce itself had to come from some means, right? And that, well, they would say if you just have dumb luck, it arrived. <laughs> and you can go through the probabilities of that as I kind of did. It's not so likely. Yes, over here. I just think. And I think your comment gets to why do people believe this, right? You kind of get into the philosophy of that. And Thomas Nagel is a famous American philosopher. And he basically said, you know what? I don't want there to be a God. I don't want to live in a universe like that. So you're not going to be able to convince him. He doesn't want it to be true. Yeah. You know, the Bible talks about uh, life is in the blood. And if we study the blood, there's a ton of stuff happening there. One. Two, um, there's the book of life, which it talks about all the information, the thousands and, and thousands of information in the DNA of each person. And there's no, each person has a, a specific information of thousands and thousands and thousands of, uh, in the DNA. And then, uh, and, and that's not just for human beings, but for every living thing in this earth. Also, that there's no, if you, there's haven't been found any life, any, in any other planet, even though they've been trying, there's no life. There's so much that, so to me, atheists have been proving, science have been proving wrong, because God created science. God is uh, the, the creator of science, one. And three is like, where there's so much information, where there's so much complexity, whether they want to believe it or not, that's their problem, and do bad because I'm not going to see them in heaven, <laughs> then be, be, behind so, uh, all this creation or design, there has to be a designer. It's just like if someone paints a, a picture, that picture didn't get there by itself, the colors didn't get there by itself, somebody put them there. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see the passion. <laughs> Over here. It's complex no matter how you slice it. Yes, here.
There's a book called The Origin of Life Circus, <laughs> where, where a, a reporter interviews these folks. And um, she indicated that a lot of funding comes from um, like foundations, from wealthy individuals who, who want to support that. Um, I don't know how much like NIH or NSF, I don't know how much, they, probably not a lot from those guys, but it's out there. Yes? So yeah, you're asking if there's, if the process of researching these things could lead to some benefits somewhere else in science. I, I do think so. I think, um, I think Venter's work, I mean, he intends to do good things to humanity. He's not necessarily trying to prove this is natural, but he's trying to find benefits to humanity and um, th there could certainly be good things to it. We've learned a lot from what he's accomplished already, for sure. Yes? That proton pump um, that was making ADP into ATP, is that taking, is that using, does it work based on the Earth's gravitational field, like a coil? Would you spin a coil? No, is no, that, it's just. Part of, the, part of how it works? No, it's just working on an electric, electric field, just like an electric motor, the ATP synthase. Right. It's working just like an electric motor. You've got high voltage here and low voltage here, and so the, Protons want to want to go this way, and it's being used. It's almost like a water wheel. You've got water high up, and it, ha it wants to get down low, and you put a wheel in there, and it's, it, it it turns because of that force. But is the Earth's magnetic field a factor? Such not as not a not that I know of. Okay, I'm just curious. Thank you. You know, I'd like to put. I'd like to end with one more comment. Um, I think I think a lot of why we're in this situation where people believe in this is um, it, it, it's a fancy term. It's an assumption behind the practice of science with a fancy name called methodological naturalism. And what that means is when you do science, when you conduct a science experiment, you start with the assumption that God is not going to mess with my experiment. If I'm just going to drop this and measure how fast it falls, that's a nice, easy, simple experiment, but I do so assuming God's not going to come in here and mess with the experiment, right? And that's a pretty reasonable assumption if I'm doing something simple like dropping an object and seeing how fast it falls. So the assumption of methodological naturalism, meaning God's not intervening here, is pretty reasonable when I'm dropping an object. But if I'm studying how did life begin, you're studying origins scientists will apply that same assumption. We have to start this research by saying God had nothing to do with it, the assumption of methodological naturalism. And under that assumption, let's study how life began. And that's a, that's a bad place to start. But no one ever acknowledges that assumption, you know? And you'll see papers written on this topic where they say, well, we all know life had to begin naturally, so let's figure it out. And that's because they started with the assumption of methodological naturalism, but they won't say that. And that's why I think we have a problem. Yeah. Yes? When an elected asked, why couldn't you give this talk in front of this university a biology class or something? They need to hear this. I'd like to. <laughs> it's hard to get in the door. Yes, over here. But it's, so, it's so fun to, to see this. You know, we all understand what we all are talking about, but when you, when you look at your talk, there's only two conclusions. One is that it all happened by chance, or there is a God that 
I wish Ernst Haeckel was alive today and could see what a bacteria really is made of. <laughs> It's kind of the ultimate sl slam down, you know, mucus. <laughs> He's really putting it down. <laughs> yes, in the back. told you, but you just don't want to believe. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for coming out this evening.